Hey guys, it's Messier82 and I'm finally back with another flyout video. For this video, I was thinking about it a little bit. During the uh, 10 gallon challenge video, if you guys remember that, I had actually landed in a very, very pretty location and I kind of wanted to put an airfield there. For those of you who don't know in flyout, you can actually create custom airfields by scripting their existence in a certain file. As long as you can put the coordinates, altitude, location, scale, start point ID, and a few other things into it, you can essentially spawn at this airfield, fly around, and do whatever you want. Now, where I landed in that 10 gallon video was a valley completely surrounded by very steep peaks and also very high wind. It's just about my favorite one runway to uh, test out fighter builds for their maneuverability, or test gliders for things like ridge lift. It's also a pretty good test of an aircraft's capabilities in high winds. Because of this, I have been really inspired to find other airfields. Actually, mapping things out in Flyout is surprisingly difficult. There is no map with coordinates, with locations, or anything like that, so it can be rather annoying to find out exactly where you are on the Flyout planet. All we have is a single geographic map provided from quite long ago. So, along with my buddy Jagjag from the Flyout server, we took some time to map out the exact locations from the Flyout map. We did this by basically taking a very fast plane and flying to space, and as well as some nearby areas to observe the terrain around us and then cross-referencing it with the map, and then eventually finding the exact location. We had a total of two locations, default airfield and desert airfield. By cross-referencing these two locations using bearings, distances, and calculating and referencing the actual curvature of the Earth to the map, we were generally able to figure out very primitively where we are on the map every flight. Now in the 10 gallon video, it took me almost four hours to get to our little location about 800 kilometers away. This is way too slow and I don't want to spend so many hundreds of hours just flying around in some tiny little Cessna ripoff looking for airfield locations. So we've decided to turn this into an entire mini-series. Exploration and cartography has always been a bit of a passion of mine, so I am more than happy exploring the flyout world for more airfield locations. Today, we're not going to be doing that much exploring because we don't actually have anything to explore with. And that's what leads us to what we're building here today. I guess it's more of an exploration craft than a craft with a true purpose, but of course we still need some goals. Our aircraft needs to cruise at a minimum speed of Mach 2.8, preferably cruise at 3.0. Our aircraft also needs to get a minimum lift drag ratio of 5.0 at cruising speed. And lastly, our aircraft needs at least 5,000 miles or about 8,000 kilometers of range. Wow, so this thing would be a fast aircraft. Like, that's literally SR-71 speeds. I aim to complete these goals in a similar way to the XB-70. For those of you who don't know, the XB-70 was able to boost its range and efficiency through a rather unique system referred to as compression lift. That's also like half the reason I made this video, by the way, because now I get to explain compression lift to everyone. So basically, how does the XB-70 generate this extra lift? Well, if you've ever seen the wingtips of the XB-70, you'll notice that they turn downwards when the aircraft is flying at supersonic speeds. Basically, in order to do this... Er, to do this, you need to divert the shocks, rather. If you haven't noticed, the ramps and fuselage behind the intakes is shaped outwards on the XB-70. As you may know, the shockwaves are formed on this wedge from the aircraft traveling at supersonic speeds. By making the shape of this wedge, the shock expands sideways and below the wings. As the shock expands, it hits the wingtips and gets diverted downwards. Because of this, some of the sideways shock this aircraft generates is instead deflected downwards, therefore pushing up on the aircraft. This method is referred to as compression lift, where the compressed air of the shock is pushed downwards to generate lift. Makes some amount of sense, right? If this explanation doesn't make sense, I'd recommend looking up some videos on how supersonic overpressures are formed, because I don't think there is enough time in the day to even begin to explain anything behind it. But... Because I'm me, I'm going to try anyways. Hmm. Okay, so... Basically, imagine... Imagine you are throwing a stone into the river. Or into, into, into a lake. You can throw a stone into a pond. As it makes contact with the water, the water becomes disturbed. 
You may notice ripples are going outwards from the source, and if they hit the shore, or a rock protruding from the water, they also may bounce and change direction. This is exactly what the air is doing at all times, we just can't see it and it's usually on a much smaller and less displaced scale. In fact, this is how acoustics and sound works, it's just waves traveling and bouncing and dispersing from the source. Obviously, just like any other wave, with the traditional properties of waves, sound must travel through a medium. A medium being a fluid in this case. Just as the medium of the stone you threw is water, the medium of sound is simply the air. Waves need something to travel through in order to be waves and entirely waves. Knowing this, each body and medium has their own wave speed. While we cannot watch air travel, we can still figure out the speed of these waves through various acoustic tests, and generally we can calculate the speed through equations with variables such as temperature and some of the compositions of the fluid that the wave is traveling through. And no, it does not need to be in a fluid to travel. But the speed of these waves in the air is known as the speed of sound, or the sound barrier, since obviously the sound that you hear can only travel as fast as the waves that are carrying it. So basically, what happens when you go faster than these waves? Imagine, again, that stone in the water. This, just as the stone in the water, you generate waves as you travel through the air. If you're moving faster than it, the waves start to compound behind you. Since they still need to be formed at the source, they cannot outspeed you in order to be in the front. The faster past the sound barrier you go, the sharper this cone of sound waves becomes. Since the waves are compounding behind you, the edge of this becomes far more compressed than anywhere else. This is referred to as the shock wave, and this is where the air has the highest pressure. These wonderful images here allow us to see the shock wave of these aircraft, for example. As you can see, it forms a cone behind trailing behind the source of disruption as it travels. This is what it is doing on the intakes of the XB-70. A sharp line is being shot towards the wingtips, where it is deflected downwards, and all that pressure dispersing downwards pushes back up on you through simply Newton's third law. As the air pushes down on you... Sorry, I totally messed that up. As you push down on the air, the air pushes up on you. Now, this is pretty advanced, and I'm not entirely sure of the exact equations or angles that should go into it, and I'm too lazy to use a CFD or do the math myself, especially for a video like this. So, instead I asked a man we will simply refer to as the Compression Lift Guy, since his name isn't appropriate for YouTube. Compression Lift Guy told me that as long as my sweep angle is about 60 degrees and those intakes are correct, which he said they were, we should get the sonic boundary directly under the wingtips, the perfect place to divert it downwards. Now, as my wingtips bend downwards at Mach 3.0, extra lift will be generated by this. I am not exactly sure how well it is modeled in Flyout. As far as I know, Flyout can't model compression lift in such a way, but I wanted to build it anyways. That being said, Flyout still models wave drag for supersonic, so you still need to shape supersonic vehicles properly if you want them to pass the sound barrier. Well, at least pass it efficiently. So let's go on to explain how I built this aircraft. It only took us eight and a half minutes to get here. And you know, if you've been watching any of the recordings, you'll also notice I've already like built the majority of the aircraft such to a point where I'm already flying it. So there's also that. Speaking of which, you guys will like this video because I actually go through a little bit more of a full build sort of thing where I also do a little bit of painting and a little bit of detail work and a lot of interior work. I never really ended up finishing this build because I had bigger fish to fry and I also wanted a little build segment for the beginning of the next exploration video I do. Because in this video, we've already taken up like 15 minutes just building this thing. I think that's going to be the final number at least. I think I set it to about 15 minutes, the time lapse. But, you know, that's going to be a lot of time. So I'm just going to do a little cinematic at the end and fly it around for a little bit while talking about it and how it works. And of course the stats and all that. But again, this aircraft isn't finished. What I'm actually going to do at the end, since this aircraft isn't a bomber, I gave it extra interior space in the back behind the pilots. Uh, with literally nothing in it. What I kind of want to do, I kind of want to take the assets from the heli home and make this like a livable aircraft that me and my friends can chill in and fly at Mach 3 halfway across the flyout universe, hypothetically. 
If only we could do that in real life at Mach 3, that'd be fantastic, but uh, we can't. So, you know, I do have a fully fledged interior. The other thing about it, I did have to move, I, I had to adjust the center of pressure a lot on this aircraft. I don't know if you noticed earlier, but basically the design goes like this. It is a very similar design to the original XB-70. One of the largest differences being it doesn't need a bomb bay, so instead it has extra fuel and extra interior space. Also, it is a four engine design instead. It has the ramp intakes pointed the right way, as well as the fuselage shaping past the intake still appropriate to angle the shock wave into the wingtips. Those wingtips have a hinge join that operates on a mock response that allows them to fold downwards. Of course, I did the full landing gear bay doors and the twin vertical stabilizers and all that, but basically this allows us to generate compression lift regardless of all that garbage. One thing that's also kind of unique, and this is what sets my aircraft apart from the other XB-70 uh, ripoffs, that's like a thing in the flyout server right now. I don't know if you guys know, but there's two other guys. There's compression lift guy and then there's pyrokinesis who have both built fantastic uh, personal takes on an XB-70 style aircraft. There's almost been a little joke going around in like the uh, flyout mod team where it's like a rite of passage to becoming a good flyout player. You have to make an XB-70 ripoff at some point in time. So this is my turn to make an XB-70 ripoff. But I did do one thing to set me apart from the other XB-70 ripoffs, and that is this one actually has folding canards. Now, it sounds like a weird choice, but it was simply because I didn't know how to make the canards as efficient as possible for all scenarios. Basically, the canard they aren't like active canards or anything, or even pitching canards, they simply act as flaps for the aircraft. And it felt kind of pointless to only use them as flaps. So what I did is I put them on a hinge joint and gave them an adjustable control. This allowed me to sweep them back based on various speeds we were traveling, and I actually found that playing around with it a little bit helped me understand what the best lift drag should be for the aircraft. When I'm flying at cruising altitude and cruising speed, for example, if I sweep them back about 58 degrees on top of the initial leading edge sweep, which equals a little bit past like 60 degrees, it's like 65 degrees or something, then that's like perfect and it actually benefits my lift drag a good amount when I do that. I think it's partly because I still have the benefit of canards but this time they they match up with a wave drag to make it as efficient as possible without you know having a massive overpressure. So you know I think actually the folding canards were a really good feature and while they aren't like the most useful thing ever I could just set them to be at that position by default. I figured I'd play around with it a little bit because I haven't actually made any like swing wings in this game yet and I wanted to see how it might work with the canards before I moved on to bigger things, which those bigger things are to come. Don't worry people, I know a lot of people have been requesting a swing wing such as an F-14. I will be making an aircraft like that at some point. Also, it's come to my attention, some of you guys may not know what wave drag is. Wave drag is basically, remember that supersonic overpressure shock thing I was talking about earlier? It's basically just all the excess drag generated by that. You know, moving all that air around your plane at supersonic speeds really, really puts a lot of pressure and it really puts a lot of drag on your aircraft. So by shaping it, shaping your planes really pointy like this is how you minimize that and that's why Basically all supersonic speeds and supersonic planes like jet fighters or SR-71s are like really pointy. It's to minimize that wave drag. But we are just about reaching the end of our actual time to talk about our aircraft here. Uh, just a quick recap, you know, it generates compression lift similar to an XB-70 and that's how it generates a lot of lift. We want to have a minimum lift drag of 5.0 and I'd like it to cruise at above 60,000 feet and at Mach 3. Um, later on we find this isn't actually that much of a challenge whatsoever and we basically blow that out of the water. I don't know if you guys just heard that, but that was my cat climbing up onto my bed. Say hi, Bo. Hi, buddy. He doesn't want to say hi. And, uh, once again, just a reminder for you guys, this build isn't really complete, it's still a work in progress. There is a lot of detail work and interior work that still needs to be done on this aircraft. Also, maybe a little bit of playing around with the engines to see if I can't optimize them a little bit better, because they, they cook. 
They really do. I, I think they're just about the best I can really get an engine for this aircraft. They're a good balance between speed and the, the sort of efficiency I'm looking for, so I don't really think I'm getting much better than this. But anyways, that's enough talking. I've wasted way too much time here. Was, we, we've gone over a little bit. All that out of the way, it was time for our test flight. Mach 3.6 capable with a cruising speed of Mach 3.1, this thing blew its initial goals out of the water. I wasn't able to tell the exact maximum range, but I'm willing to bet that it was around 7, 8, or maybe even 9,000 miles. On top of that, my initial lift-drag goal of 5.0 was completely blown out of the water, as this thing could hit about 7.2 lift-drag at its cruising speed at about 65,000 feet. Once again, still not entirely sure if compression lift is modeled in flyout, but I enjoyed building this thing either way. Until the next one, guys. Goodbye. <laughs>